again, I'm going to make you a co-host. All right, and you should be able to share. That works. Thank you. And we have a little mix up here on the span. Okay. Okay, so just for those joining us that are requiring any interpretation, just to repeat, Elsa is on the Spanish channel and Hannah is on the Arabic channel. Uh, Zoom doesn't allow us actually to um, select Arabic as a language. Um, so it might appear as Hannah is in French, um, but she is actually translating in Arabic and Elsa in Spanish. Para aquellos que acabaron de reunirse eh, con nosotros en esta reunión, les comentamos que tenemos a disposición canales con intérpretes. Here we go. Okay. 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 We're just hitting 9.15. Everybody who's joining us, um, we have a lot of uh attendees joining right now we're just waiting for one more panelist who i am going to reach out to right now <clears throat> okay, why don't we get started and um, hopefully our other panelists, Emily Billings from South County will join us momentarily. And if not, we, we will make through it. <laughs> um, Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. And I know others are, are joining as we're, as we're uh, speaking here. We expect about 100 at attendees. So um, I'm very happy and uh, thankful that you're all joining us here for this important conversation. 
For those that don't know me, I'm Mary Beth Campbell. I'm the executive director of the Worcester Community Action Council. Uh, and we have launched a series of community conversations. And this is the second in the series. Uh, we hosted an event on early education and care in March. Uh, and this is our second on the cliff effect and navigating the cliff effect in breaking through barriers. We're excited to also soon be announcing uh, two more community conversations, one on workforce development and the future of work as we face um, workforce shortages and recruiting challenges and retention challenges coming through COVID. And then we will also have a topic on climate change and resiliency. So we're really excited to be hosting these events and create kind of a momentum and cadence of conversation around these important topics, not only that Worcester Community Action Council works on, but also that we work on with a community at large and that are important and critical issues for us. I am really excited this morning to be talking uh, with this panel of expertise uh, in each of them. I consider great colleagues and friends uh, in the work that we do at Worcester Community Action Council and across our region from the city of Worcester down through Southern Worcester County. And we're joined here by four women who I consider to be incredible leaders and, and policy drivers and, um, and passionate, committed people in our community uh, who hold people like me accountable, who run a, a community action agency, uh, hold me as partner, hold us as partner, and hold each other together through what are really challenging and difficult times in terms of working across the community to try to bake, break barriers uh, for everyone that we partner and serve with across our communities. Uh, so I'm really excited for this conversation this morning. Uh, one of the pieces, one of the reasons that we wanted to focus on navigating the cliff effect this morning is that Worcester Community Action Council has launched a relatively new set of work that we're calling the Resiliency Center. Uh, and that's not so much a, a brick and mortar strategy for us, but really a way for us to better mirror and mobilize our own services between the regions that we serve in the city of Worcester and Southern Worcester County. Uh, we find over, the, especially through COVID, uh, we really want to make a more conservative strategy and effort to integrate and interlock our services for clients that we know who walk through our door may come to us in crisis with one issue, but as we build trust and relationship with them and open the door to conversation, we know that there are multiple issues that they're facing across housing, mental health, food security, uh, mm -hmm. access to good jobs and healthcare. And while WCAC does not provide all of those services in response to that, uh, we serve a lot of people. We have an incredible staff that cares deeply about the communities where we are present and where we serve. So we feel really strongly that we wanna uh, grow and work on the ways that we integrate our services, uh, not only with across our programs, but also with our partners. So the Resiliency Center is really an, an effort to emphasize greater resource and referral structure, network and services while also and equally focusing on economic mobility. And so we've started to build strategies around financial empowerment. Uh, we have a financial empowerment director in Tara Oliveira who's on our staff. And we recently hired a cliff effect coach down in Southern Worcester County, Melissa Trinidad, who hopefully you'll hear from a little bit uh, uh, momentarily uh, after the, the panel uh, concludes and also hoping to hire a Cliff Effect coach for Worcester. So just a quick, quick plug for that. Uh, we do have a Cliff Effect coach role uh, described on our site. Uh, and we are especially looking for an individual who is bilingual. Um, so if you know anyone, and especially after you hear a little bit more uh, about this work today and from Melissa and the role that she has in Southern Worcester County, she's looking for a partner. Uh, so please feel free to spread the word uh, for us because we are looking to get that work going in Worcester as well. And then we also have a financial coach, uh, a woman that many of you may know, Laura Martinez. She's worked on the REACH grant. Uh, she does a lot of race equity work in the city uh, and has been a great partner to us to help build that, um, that on-ramp for financial coaching for us, building curriculum and working one-on-one -on -one with clients as well. So we're starting to build these, these blocks of this work of the Resiliency Center so we thought this was a good time to talk about, you know, why are we doing this? Uh, and I, I can't think of uh, four better women um, for us to, to talk with and learn from um, than the women that we have here today. So I'll do a, a quick introduction. 
of everyone who's here, Ellen Ganling, uh, who thank you, Ellen, for helping develop these community conversations with us. We are going to put their bios in the um, in the chat. Uh, so I'm not going to read every single bio, but uh, you'll have that information in the chat. And if you follow us on social media, we've been posting beautiful pictures and, and bios of everybody. Um, and so I encourage you to follow us on all of our social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Um, we haven't done the TikTok yet, but we're getting there. Uh, but uh, their full information is that, and it will be in the chat as well. Um, so I just, I'm going to do a quick round of introductions, and then I'm going to kick off with the first set of questions uh, for our panelists. And we're joined here this morning by Ann Candillas. Um, Ann comes uh, from our Western Mass Partnership in Springfield and Springfield Works. Um, I consider Ann someone who's been a leader in the Cliff Effect work. Uh, she's, you're going to hear a little bit about that today, but has been a good uh, colleague and friend in the economic development world really leveraging economic development tools and strategizing around how those tools can help to improve how individuals navigate um, less of a cliff and, and more of a slope in the cliff effect um, challenges that our clients face. So Anne will talk a little bit more about her work and introduce more of herself as we go. Um, Anne is also joined by Gina Platanino. Um, and for those of you that don't know Gina, I'm, I'm very excited for whatever Gina is about to say this morning. <laughs> Gina is uh, a bold and, and brazen leader in our community, especially in the city of Worcester. Um, if there's many good things happening in the city that open the doors for the individuals we serve, Gina is likely behind it. Um, she most recently joined the Mass Law Reform Institute. Uh, we're excited to have her at the, at the uh, working there as a, a new partner in that role. Uh, but Gina is also a consummate community advocate and voice uh, through Worcester Together, through the mayor's uh, food security task force uh, on several boards across the city. So she's got not only great influence, but she leads with heart uh, and with keen mind as well. So we're really lucky to be good friend and partner uh, to Gina. Uh, we're also joined by our Southern uh, Worcester County friends and partners um, who we're building and have great relationships with um, Yurka Torres is uh, from Catholic Charities in Southern Worcester County uh, and the administrator there. And we are so excited to have embarked most recently with Yurka and her work, especially through our free tax prep program and uh, called VITA. Um, Yurka, uh, we reached out to Yurka a couple months ago and before we even finished our sentence, uh, Yurka was on board, uh, ready to work with us to open up the doors uh, for access to things like the early income tax credit, which you'll hear us talk a little bit about today, the child tax credit, and creating opportunities uh, for income eligible individuals and families to get access to tax preparation. Uh, but Catholic Charity is an incredible partner to WCAC, uh, both in the city of Worcester and southern Worcester County. Uh, and just a really robust um, agency and organization with great staff and we're so excited to have Mirka here this morning. And certainly not last, uh, last but not least um, is Emily Billings. Uh, Emily is the director of the Family Resource Center of Southbridge in a relatively new role there. Uh, prior to that, Emily was with Southbridge Community Connections, uh, two excellent great partners in Southern Worcester County, especially Southbridge uh, for us and many partners across that region. Uh, really focusing on elevating the voice of consumers and clients in the community, um, coalescing around critical issues, and Emily in this role in the Family Resource Center uh, being a great partner both in referral, two-way street referral back and forth, but really trying to coordinate our services, um, most recently focusing on this cliff effect role uh, and serving uh, families and families with children in Southern Worcester County. And then of course, uh, we have our early education and care continuum from prenatal to kindergarten in Southern Worcester County through Head Start, Healthy Families and Early Head Start. Um, we have a lot of client crossover with the Family Resource Center um, and look forward to so much opportunity that we're going to have together to serve Southern Worcester County and Southbridge in particular. So welcome, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for spending a little bit of time with us this morning. Um, and if I missed anything critical in your introduction, please feel free to speak to your work a little bit more as I uh, round robin our questions. So just so everybody knows, um, we are um, we, we're using this Zoom platform. Um, I think we're still having a little bit of challenge with uh, our 
interpretation. I'm going to try to fix that quickly. One second, um, Flavia, let me know if this is if that worked. What I just did. Uh, we have two functions in terms of submitting questions. Oops, sorry, sorry about that. Sorry about that. I think I just messed that up. Okay. Let's make sure that worked. Okay. We have two opportunities to uh, ask questions. So actually three opportunities. So uh, in the typical chat function, you can put your questions in there. And then we also have the Q&A function as well. So we'll be monitoring that as well. And then um, if you're, uh, there's a few people that have asked to queue up um, to respond to the panel. So I'll unmute uh, a few people. Um, or if you have anything that you absolutely feel like you want to vocalize orally rather than written, um, you can shoot me a text in the chat and I can unmute you. Um, so we'll try to use all those avenues for conversation. So let me click kick this off this morning, um, starting with you, Anne. Uh, and um, just for those that may not be as familiar with what it is that we're talking about this morning around the cliff effect, can you talk to us a little bit about what the cliff effect is? I can, thank you very much. And thank you, Mary Beth and Ellen and panelists. I'm excited to be here today. The cliff effect has been, you know, it, interesting when Springfield Works kicked off in um, 2016, we actually launched really 2017 as part of the Working Cities Challenge. One of the things we talked about was resilience, economic resilience and opportunity for all. And what did that look like? And really early on, it became very evident that this term cliff effect, which wasn't a, um, a household name yet, um, was an impact to, to opportunity and prosperity and upward mobility. And so, and this happened right away and employers didn't quite understand exactly why people might not want promotions or might not accept a full-time job. And that really launched our conversation around what the barriers were, what the systemic barriers were. And Springfield Works is really focused on breaking down and removing those barriers. So the cliff effect I will describe, um, I'm gonna show a couple of slides just so you get a visual of, of what it really looks like for um, a working family. So cliff effects only apply to working families. So the way the public assistance programs are structured can really disincentivize work and disrupt financial stability. So when a family receives um, certain benefit, you know, uh, public benefits, so whether it's SNAP or childcare assistance or housing subsidies, when a, when a family receives public assistance and starts to make a little bit of money the public assistance drops very, very quickly. And so what happens is they, you know, the family loses that public assistance, but isn't making enough to afford their basic needs. Um, and so the cliff effect is really a disincentive to, to work and to upward mobility. So let me give you just a quick example. So if you get a little bit of money, let's say I get, you know, two, a dollar or two more an hour. So if you're working full time, that's about $2,000 a year. So you're going to make $4,000. But what is going to happen after, after childcare, housing, food, and other potential subsidies drop, you may actually be losing ten dollars or $12,000 in resources. And so you know, so so families and rightfully so make an economic decision not to take certain opportunities because of the economics. And so I want to show you just a couple of pictures so you get a sense. Um, and we're showing this to employers too, so they understand what their low moderate income worker financial situation is. So let me show you screen one. Can you see my screen? Yes. We typically model uh, a typical family size in Springfield is three. 
And we modeled head of household, two children, age three and nine. If you look at the healthcare industry, 78% of workers are women. If you look at education, high percentage are women. And so, and we have many families who are heads of household and they're the sole breadwinner. So if you look at this gray line, even without public benefits, let's just look at what this particular family needs to make in order to make ends meet. And this is not without, this is without public assistance. So this gray line, this family needs to make $54,000 a year. And actually I just reran the MIT living wage calculator. It's up to 62, but let's just use this example. Um, so when this family starts with no assistance and no benefits, this family starts with a $16,000 deficit. And this is take home pay of about $36,000 if you're a medical assistant. If you're a CNA, it's a little bit less. But let's look at the maroon line. So they're already starting with a gap in affordability in, 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 um, in their ability to just pay their bills. And family self-sufficiency really is just basic expenses. It doesn't include savings. It doesn't include you know, um, student loans. This is just bare bones. So when you look at, so when I look at cliff effects, cliff effects impact not only the ability to enter the workforce, but it actually creates a stagnation in somebody's career because what happens is even without public assistance, you can see that it takes 10 years. So the 29 is, is their age. It takes 10 years just to break even. And then the only reason why now at age 45, uh, they're, they're um, actually ahead of their family self-sufficiency um, uh, amount is, is because they no longer need childcare and, and other expenses go down when the kids start to move out. So it's, it's um, so when you just look at the basic needs, and now I wanna show you what this looks like with public assistance. So in order for, for head of household to, um, to actually take this job and in order to make ends meet, public assistance is required to close that gap. And, and so as the family receives public assistance, you can see now they're a little bit ahead of the curve at the beginning because um, some of the public assistance is closing that gap that we just talked about. But you can see these dips, these dips. And it's interesting, I was talking to one employer, their biggest retention issue is about two years. So this is, a, this is very interesting because at the beginning um, when you're making near minimum wage, you're actually um, receiving enough benefits. You're, you're receiving about fifty-three or $54,000 a year in value. So you're almost break even there. Um, what happens with these dips is as you start making more money, the benefits drop and that's what these dips are. And you can see some very big dips um, which occur in housing. Childcare has gotten better and we need to remodel this. Um, because the cliff is now out um, a little further. So if you're fortunate enough to receive public assistance, which not everybody can because there's large wait lists, um, it, it may not be enough to help you sustain and move up. And so, so what has to happen, you know, so we need solutions to, to close that gap and create economic incentives in order to stay in the workforce. And I'll just, pause there and yeah i'll just pause there and um, stop sharing in case okay. you have any questions thanks ann let me um, i'm just gonna do a little round robin across the panel and just sort of get reaction to what ann just described and start gina with you also i'll i'll add this tidbit in that i think will <laughs> be uh what we can all react to there was an article this morning um about the birth um, Berkshire Hathaway event that Warren Buffett um, hosts every year. And he made a comment relative to growth of inflation and his response and solution to how inflation is impacting people. 
and his, his answer upon someone questioning that was, well, you have to become really good at something during high inflation. You, sh you need to be really skilled at something. That was his, that was his answer and his solution. And it, it, I have a, had a visceral reaction to that, his response, but I, I'm, Gina, what's your reaction to how Anne is, has described this, um, this challenge that individuals that we all serve face balanced with this, the, the growing inflation in our spending power actually going down. Um, you know, we have real systems challenges. Where, where and how are the systems failing us at this point? So I'll, I'll answer from like the food security perspective, which really is a health uh, perspective to what Ann said, which is working individuals. People are working, they just don't have enough. And so to answer Mr. Buffett, I would say that that client population knows how to pinch the budget and make do with very little, but that is not helping them with inflation. And that sort of comment that you make, Mary Beth, is which I, you know, why, why I stated that are working individuals because there's this disconnect at, at, at the levels of power into like, you know, the average lives of daily lives Americans and the struggles that they are facing. And, you know, that tone deaf comment, which I'm sure was lauded by many, like, oh, absolutely. If people just, do more if people just work harder, but the individuals like, you know, as Anne is describing, working two to three jobs and it is not enough. They can't take that promotion. They can't go to the wonderful college. I have a degree because then everything else goes down. And one of the things we don't talk about is that many of these programs, while they're at the poverty level, we talk about, oh, this is how much they have to apply is gross, not net, right? So, you know, Mr. Buffett, he said it many times, he pays less taxes than his secretary, right? So just sort of think about that, how a working class individual, how much taxes he's paying at the end of the day, and somehow that can push the person by 25 cents. Just think about that, like what that means, 25 cents. I lose childcare, I lose cash benefits, I, I lose SNAP, and it puts me in a workspace. I, I, I noticed that um, you, know, you, you had a couple of people who help here with work development. How much harder is their job? Think about that, just how much harder is a job to sort of try to support someone when you know it's, I can't afford to live my life if I don't have these resources. So to answer your question, Mary Beth, I would love the Warren Buffett's of the world, and even just start even more, more locally, right? Who are our town selectmen? Um, because we have ARPA money coming in. The mayor of Cambridge just set out a wonderful cash plan that people, all people within 100% of the poverty level are getting $500 a month for a year. That's incredible. That's what ARPA is supposed to do, right? So think about sort of creator ways at the state level. How are we earmarking? At the federal level, when we're sitting and making these policies, are we listening to individuals who have no lived experience, who are not part of the communities that are being affected to make up these policies? So that, that's why I, I would say, Mary Beth, that there's this huge disconnect because people are not walking, they're not talking, they're not in the spaces where people are actually living the results of just really terrible policy. And we can go really deep and talk about this, how a lot of these policies are, are, are centered in, in this fear of like, oh no, uh, people of color might get it. Um, there's like a lot of data that shows like racist practices that are really behind a lot of these policies of why, and, and the misunderstanding and the misguidance that is these people. They're just, uh, I think it was, um, I forget which elected official uh, from Kentucky was, that said, uh, we just need to get people back to work. Here, sir they are working, it's just not enough. And I think that's sort of part of the conversation that we need to have with individuals, that these are working individuals and yet our system has, has let them down. So this idea of the American dream that if you work hard enough, it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's if you work hard enough and if you have the right connections, if you went to the right schools, if you came from the right family, if you have the right color of skin, then the American dream can be possible to you, but not if, God forbid, you happen to have grown in a family of poverty, it's just a lot more difficult to risk and mm -hmm. it's just difficult to escape that and have access to those resources that I will allow you to escape generational poverty. Thanks, Gina. I'm gonna to move to Mirka and Emily, who I think your organizations are really at the front line doing the real relationship building, transactional work with clients that um, we share too. Mirka, just based on, what Anne and, and Gina have already shared. Um, can you share a bit 
about your reaction to that and um, what you see every day in working with clients or the, the client profile, you know, Gina describes the working, really the working family, the working individual, um, but some of the, the day-to-day challenges as an individual who's actually trying to help people navigate this. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yes, good morning. Um, yeah, what I, I was listening to Ann and Gina is just a reality that um, we here at Catholic Charity see on a daily basis. Um, the people that come and walk through the doors are not the people that um, most people expect. They expect people that are not working. They expect people that are um, just benefits that they're not doing anything with their life. But that's not really the case. The case is that um, people that are working, um, even two-parent households working, sometimes they don't even have enough to be able to sustain their families. Um, uh, we, we need to kind of change the culture, the way that people think, not just um, employers, but also sometimes providers, because um, if they're used to seeing um, people that are very extremely low income, and then they see someone that has a little bit of income, they're like, oh, but they have income, they don't need any help, but they do need help, because there's this great gap that um, is not allowing them to move forward. And I love, and we provide um, budgeting classes and manage financial management classes, but then when there's not enough money to manage, they're, they're, they help, but it's just not enough there for them to be able to, they can try to budget all they want, it's just not enough income there. So the reality is that we see families day in and day out. Um, we see single families um, with a one parent or even grandparents. Um, it is very difficult. I'm seeing elderly working um, that are supposed to be retired and they're coming by and asking for some assistance. You know, um, I, I've seen people that have never used a system before because of COVID and all the different um, things that are happening. It's their first time they have no clue how to get assistance um, and or where to go. So it is is this effect, I mean, we've been hearing it for, for a while, even when we started realizing what happened and what is happening and any continues. And I think it has gotten even worse um, with the pandemic and COVID-19. Thank you. Emily, same question to you in terms of, um, you know, you're, you're working directly with families with children. I'm sure you're seeing a lot of the similar things that Mirka just mentioned. Can you speak a little bit to what, the Family Resource Center is doing um, to address some of this? Absolutely. Um, yeah, we see a lot of families coming in that are struggling with all of these things that everyone has talked about of, of finding that balance of how do you put food on the table and um, try to find a job and but have benefits. And as I really appreciated Marika bringing up that um, a lot of these families have never applied for assistance before. So a lot of what we end up doing at the Family Resource Center is helping them navigate systems that are not user friendly um, and are not created for someone to be able to pick up an application and log on a website and instantly know how to do it. Whether it's a housing application, a benefits application, um, just following up on a housing application and knowing where you stand, these are not straightforward and simple processes. Um, so this is a lot of what our staff are doing is, is helping, helping them navigate that, helping them understand um, an application that they've never seen before, um, making those follow-up calls on their behalf because when they're working those three jobs and trying to figure out childcare and everything else, they don't have the time to be calling, you know, once a week to a housing, you know, authority to check on where they stand on a wait list, did their application um, get submitted, heaven forbid that documentation is required to be faxed in. Um, who has a home fax right now? Um, a lot of our, of our families are you know, lucky to be able to afford internet at home. Um, so when we're requiring, um, you know, things to be submitted online, that's a major challenge. In the Southbridge area, transportation is a major challenge. So instead, if you have to do the application in person, um, there's not enough flexibility in the system to be able to allow for the, the life situations that our families are dealing with. And I think that um, you know bringing up COVID, I think obviously has made everything um, so much more challenging. Like we we are seeing families come in um, that aren't working sometimes because their field has essentially been eliminated. You know, if someone's has been supporting their family by being a waitress at a restaurant, suddenly that got pulled out from under their feet, um, and so they are having to navigate this for the first time. Um, yeah, it's it's a 
where we don't, the system is not created for families to be able to get themselves out of without a whole lot of support, um, which is obviously what we're all here to talk about today. And that, <clears throat> that leads, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A that I'll make sure that I read to because it's very relevant to what we're talking about, but I'm gonna ask a um, kind of a, a, a levers question of all of you, and I'll, I'll start with you, Anne, of, um, you know, to Emily's point, uh, and I, I think all four of you have heard me say this before, but I've in my now almost three years in this role, I'm convinced that most of our public and public funders do not have a mission to solve poverty, as far as I can tell. <laughs> uh, they're very focused on uh, implementation of uh, what I would consider some bureaucratic challenges, uh, both for our own agencies and staff, but it's certainly for the individuals who receive services from our organization. Emily, you described that and articulated that really well of uh, the navigation of systems is so time consuming and resource consuming for individuals. Uh, this is, is a question for everybody, but if we can start with you, Anne, uh, if we could redesign the system uh, or think about the tools that already exist um, so that we're not necessarily always creating a workaround or aftermarket solution, what are what are some of those tools and levers that we ought to be focusing on? Um, because you know, categorical eligibility, um, this uh, heavy lift of multiple documentation, different criteria, that is a huge challenge for, for everyone coming through our doors. You know, I once, um, I heard somebody say that, you know, the government created this problem and, they're going, and the government's going to have to solve it. So one of the biggest issues is that these systems are not, dis are not connected in any way. So when you look at SNAP, that's different than childcare, that's different than, than um, housing, it's different than social security. So all of these systems are not connected in any way. And, and so when you look at, um, so when you look at the complexity of the systems, you know, if you get a little bit more cash, you got to pay more rent. If you get, you know, and then you lose um, food, food support. So these systems are not connected and that, you know, and so while we think about what, what would be ideal, ideal is to make a living wage. And that's, you know, and that's why we really look to employers first to say, look, this is what, the profile of your typical worker looks like. They are working hard and not making ends meet. And so, so several things have to happen. Um, one is um, folks need an opportunity to move up. And so what can we do you know, systemically to, to create that opportunity? We do have some tools. Um, in fact, um, Springfield works with the, with the Economic Development Council and the Food Bank of Western Mass launched the Economic Pathways Coalition, which is a statewide coalition to really um, make the, the cliff effect more visible, but also to create a temp what I would call almost like a temporary solution while other solutions are being um, uh, drafted, if you will. So we saw major change in the child care subsidy program, which is super beneficial. Um, but that's only one part of the systems that folks have to rely on. If you're a medical assistant making $18 an hour, you're making take home pay about $32,000 and you need 54. So one of the things we look to is the earned income tax credit. The earned income tax credit is, while it's not a perfect tool and there can be some adjustments to it, um, the way it works right now isn't really assisting people on upward mobility. So it's great to have earned income tax credit, but that too is a cliff. So just as you're losing some of the benefits um, from the other programs, you're also you know, losing a fair amount of, of the earned income tax credit, which is designed to support working families. And so one of the things we proposed in Massachusetts, and it's in fact, it's in ways and means right now, is, is, a, is, a, is a, what I would call a, a temporary fix to support families as they move up the income scale. So the way it works is the earned income tax credit, let's say um, my base year uh, when I started working and receiving my benefits, is 
And the next year I get a $2 an hour raise and now my net resources are $45,000. So that is a $7,000 difference. No, that's in, how much is that? So 50, so 45 to 54. So that's a $9,000 difference. I just um, have less resources nine of $9,000. So what we proposed is to have the state of Massachusetts um, create a supplemental earned income tax credit to close that $9,000 gap. So, so head of household continues on the, their upward mobility, their journey to upward mobility. And workforce development programs um, and employers invest in that upward mobility. So it takes multiple systems in order to move people out of um, this generational poverty, this, this, um, this trap, if you will. Of, um, of, of poverty. So the earned income tax credit can be a really useful tool. Um, that's not to say that government um, also needs to, you know, change the systems that are not working. Um, but the earned income tax credit can be a great tool. One, because it's, um, it, when you receive earned income tax credit, it does not um, impact your the calculations for for your level of subsidies, and so that's a huge. Um, that was one of the trickiest things in thinking about what government can do right now. So we we do have a uh, legislation pending. Um, uh, Senator Lesser is our Senate sponsor, and um, and representatives uh, Duffy and Gonzalez are our House sponsors. And we encourage everybody to support the legislation um, as we invest in, in upward mobility and, and families. Thanks, Anne. And um, for Emily and, and Mirka, I think what Anne is speaking to also is this, and I think Chantel in, um, in the chat, uh, who's from the Coalition for Healthy Greater Worcester kind of speaks very accurately to this, is the reality is this is all very connected. You know, we aren't, they're not, they might be siloed, uh, organ, um, uh, funders or siloed uh, departments, but the reality is it's very inter interconnected at the, the consumer client level in terms of how people um, navigate all this. What do you, when you're, when you're working with clients, what are the, what are the tools that if you could reinvent the wheel here a little bit or reinvent the system, um, what are you, the things that you find may ease, ease this path a little bit for the clients that you're working with? Um, at least for the clients, the clientele that we see, um, which is a lot of them are bilingual, um, is having access to um, interpretation and people that they can connect directly. Um, I have been present during um, interpretation sometimes, and it just becomes a little difficult, and a lot of things get lost in translation. Um, so finding a way to um, improve that, um, also just changing the culture and educating um, in, the, in the local level, state level and um, nationwide. It's just um, when I'm hearing Ann talk about all these different numbers and um, income to living wages, to cost of living and things like that. But the reality is when they come, um, there isn't a simple way for them to be able to gain and have access to all those needs that um, the client have. Um, so for me, if there will be a way to change things will be, so it could be simpler, user-friendly. Um, even things apparently have gotten simpler because they're online or they're um, web-based, but that also comes with its difficulties and challenges because there's a lot of people that don't have access to computers or internet or are not knowledgeable of um, internet resources. So simplicity and being user-friendly would be one um, of the things that um, I, will, I will go for. And also I hear, um, and we talk about, a lot about as providers about wraparound services, that we wanna make sure that we, we cover all the bases, but then I see it in the other side as wraparound support because the support that clients need is what will help them be able to be successful, um, like childcare, um, being able to afford food. Um, is, is, 
our clients sometimes have to make a decision between eating or paying a bill. Um, do I buy enough food or do I pay my bills? And then the judgment that they get from other people is like, oh, well, you haven't paid your utilities, but it's because they have to make a decision. Do I feed my family or do I pay this utility bill? Um, these are working people. This is it's people that go to work sometimes one, two, three jobs, um, but they're not making enough. So simplicity, user-friendly, and being able to have wraparound supporter services, not just wraparound services, because that we have. We can send people, refer them. We can help them ourselves, help them navigate the systems, but the supports, they get lost after, um, as the cliff effect um, and Ann was explaining, and also Gina, um, it's just, it, they, they lose it. They get a little bit more, and they lose more than that they're gaining. Okay. And to piggyback on what Mirka said around um, the wraparound services piece. So the Family Resource Center in both Southbridge and also the one in Worcester is a part of um, UINC and Seven Hills Foundation, which provide mental and behavioral health, which I think also becomes such a um, such an involved piece of this as well, when you're looking at the impact on families' mental and physical health, when they aren't able to afford um, to afford medical care, or when parents are taking on such a tremendous amount of extra stress and trauma um, while trying to navigate all of this. So when we talk about it all being interconnected, it really is. You can't treat mental health without recognizing that a family is dealing with housing instability and is struggling to put food on their on their table. Um, and I think that really on a, a greater level needs to be understood. Those of us that see the families walk in the door every day, you can't you can't work with these families and not recognize that. Um, and I think on a human level, we should all be able to understand that as well um, of what that toll of stress looks like and how interconnected everything is. Um, but I don't think on a greater level that that is what is seen, um, that instead we focus on the numbers, we focus on um, the number of people working, the amount of money they earn, things like that. When we're looking at a human level, we can't look at one of these things um, without another, which, um, I wanted to comment also, Mary Beth, you had mentioned kind of the disconnectedness of systems, which I think has been alluded to by several different people. And you know, when we're talking about an ideal system for this, wouldn't it be wonderful if a family could gain eligibility to all of those programs at once? Wouldn't it be wonderful if there was a way to be screened in to apply for housing and to have the system also say, oh yes, and you also qualify for SNAP and you also qualify for fuel assistance? Um, because we have, you know, we have families, see families every day who are receiving one benefit and don't even know that another program exists. Um, and yes, it would be wonderful if, if we had a system where people were making enough money to not need these, but that's not where we're at right now. And so we need to make these systems as, as user-friendly as possible for families. Thank you. Gina, <clears throat> is it possible? <laughs> Uh, you mentioned ARPA earlier, Gina, and I know, um, you know, Emily and, and Mirka just mentioned this too, and I see Chantel offering similar comments relative to things like cultural proficiency and awareness, you know, the human humanity of this and um, removing judgment. Um, where You've done a lot and have worked on a lot of examples that address some of that, um, that those that work is possible to do this in a way that um, meets people where they are with them. Uh, and not um, for them. I think there's a lot of sentiment uh, across the work of in government, and I'm, I'm a recovering government worker um, of 20 years. And so I think there, there is a lot of for them sentiment rather than with people. And Gina, you've been really successful in holding accountability to make sure consumer resident, you know, people's voice are at the table. Can you talk a little bit about some examples where that's that? That works and it shows it's possible that we can make some we can make some change here at the system level. Absolutely. Be before I do though, I just, just want to address something that, that Mirka and Emily brought, which is the having to go to different doors for people. I want to tell you that as a full-time job for individuals who already have two to three jobs, and it's really burdensome. And the reason why I bring that up is just there was an article on the Boston Globe earlier this year where people were utilizing all the federal money for housing. 
But when no one bothered to talk to the people utilizing the program is, and I'm looking at Emily, people at the FRC were spending two to three hours per person helping them navigate this system <laughs> for them later on, two weeks later to say, your application is incomplete, you're denied, start all over again. That wasn't part of the conversation because they didn't speak to people. So it was easier, again, to Mary Beth's point, to blame individuals trying to utilize the system when even an organization whose job is to do this was helping and wasn't being successful because it went online. People had to submit things online and it became very difficult. And I will get to your question, Mary Beth, but I think this is, this is important as we talk about this. Yes, Mirka said, things are going online. That's a privilege issue that people are not addressing. And I wanna call out um, Senator Moore and, and, Rep. Keefe's, and uh, Rep. Duffy's bill, which is the safety net, which is making sure that DTA offices who provide all of this can close or they can move without community feedback because that's an issue. Um, working with particularly a lot of immigrant individuals they like the in-person interaction. It's really difficult over their phone to get interpretation. Um, the older population, older adults also preferred in-person contact. So just wanna flag that, I'll, I'll put it in the chat. And the last thing I'll say is Chantel, because you brought it in is that compassionate point of view is really to what Mary Beth's point, you know, is talking about. How do we involve individuals as part of this? Uh, a simple example is this, I'm fortunate to have a, a great co-chair, uh, Charlotte, Charla Hickson, uh, that's my co-chair of the DTA advisory board. And one of the things we worked on is this advisory board was made out of people like me. We were, were not utilizing SNAP. We're telling, I work with clients, but I will call out that that's not my lived experience. So I can advocate for them all day long, but at the end of the day, warm bed, food, I am not, you know, it's not a full-time job to access these resources. And we said, you know, DTA, you're asking us the Department of Precision Assistance who manages a lot of these programs you need to hear from the people. So we specifically went out and said, can we work with consultants of lived experience? Because we need to give them that dignity. Consultants of lived experience. And can we figure out how to compensate you? It took a while. We still haven't gotten to the point, but you know, just, in, and here's the, here's the kicker. We can't do it after a certain amount. It has to be a gift card so that, the, so that they won't be punished or you know, they won't lose their benefits for participating. Where it's part of my job to sit at this board. I mean, just, you know, we talk about those barriers. All of us sit part of that, you know, um, Charla, my co-chair is part of the Community Action Council. Like it's part of our job to be in these spaces. But yeah, we want people, consultants with lived experience to take off from work, figure out childcare and participate. And when they don't participate, shame on you, you don't want to speak up. So I just want us to think about that, why, you know, our community sometimes is not part of those boards. And so we brought them on and a perfect example, um, the, um, they, DTA had spent all this money on sending out, figuring out how to send text messages because that was the best way to outreach. And one of the parents who, who, who was part of our board, oh, was that you? Oh, we thought it was spam. Me and my girlfriends, we just deleted it and blocked it. So here you go. DTA spent all this money with consultants instead of just asking their own clients to say like, Gina, I, is this something you would use? What sort of language? And they come to individuals like me, but why aren't they have really access to consultants that can tell them this? And that's just like a really silly, simple example, but I see it constantly within organizations. Um, uh, another example, I, I would say, you know, there was um, the Commission of the Blind when it moved. When I asked the commissioner, I, I, I said, you know, did you? Who was part of that decision making? Oh, we consulted and did a lot of research. And I was like, absolutely. But who was part of that committee? Well, our, our senior staff, and I'm like, well, are any of them can are, are they blind? Uh, are any of them low income? Well, no. And I'm like, then how how do you how do you make those decisions? So I think just sort of asking people to think, and you will think that it it comes very intuitively, like, oh, this should just happen. When you live in a particular network where everyone thinks like you, when everyone talks like you, it's difficult to sort of step out of, out of, out of that. And I think, I wouldn't say that I have been successful. I think the community has been successful in filtering the voices and utilizing people to bring that. Um, I, I will say that because I, I can't take any credit. Um, I'm happy to just sort of, you know, help people. Um, but that, you know, that, that would be one of the ways um, that I think we, we have done a lot of work um, in sort of bringing consultants with lived experience and, and similar spaces. 
Thank you, Gina. That's um, a great point in terms of inclusion and um, the experience at the right on the front lines as well. Um, I'm going to um, I'm going to ask Anne to make um, a couple of points relative to some of the tools that she's been working on. That are, actually we've been lucky because now we're part of the the coalition that she mentioned um, to have access to. And our, our Cliff Effect coach, who we'll hear from in a couple minutes, um, has started. But I want to combine a, a little bit of the question, Anne. Because um, I know you do a lot of, of research, and um, our colleagues at the African Community Education uh, Center have um, posed a question in the Q and A relative to what percentage of low-income people get this a, a trio of housing assistance, EBT, and childcare, and you know, how many people are actually are, are accessing multiple levels of benefits, um, and what might be the most the, the top benefits that um, people are actually tend to access. I think. There's also a childcare question in here as well, which is certainly we had a whole panel on this um, because it's such an expensive um, and challenging um, resource to access right now, especially with COVID. I mean, that's certainly um, the voucher system and, and benefits there are uh, play a huge role in this, but I know you're working on whole family approaches. So can you speak a little bit to that um, relative to um, this question from ACE, but also the tools that you're looking at that help you look at that data? Well, thank you. Again, um, yeah, we what what we really see, and you all see, and, and we've alluded to it already, is that there are a lot of programs. We always say we're rich in programs, but poor in systems. There's programs for parents. There's programs for children. There's poor. There's programs for mental health. There's programs for childcare. There's programs for uh, workforce development. But it's the connection of the programs that are not, you know, where there's no system. And so one of the things uh, we did locally uh, with 15 organizations plus, and we have a parent council now um, helping to advise us who are paid, by the way, that's the other thing. So Gina, thank you for raising the, the voices um, comment because um, just like we get paid, they ought to be paid too. And so um, the whole family approach is really looking at um, all members of a family. Um, so sometimes we say two generation when it's a uh, parent and child, but so many of our families are three and even four generations. So the whole family approach is really to create a, uh, a collaborative approach to um, serving a family. So it's not about program outcomes, it's about family outcomes. And we're finding um, tremendous success when we're working with our agency partners, our education institutions, our employer partners, and families um, and our wraparound um, uh, partners to actually create collaborations of service, a collaboration of services. It's not how it's funded and that's what's so tricky. I know the Davis Foundation is, is listening in. I saw them on the participant list um, and they you know, uh, support a whole family approach. Um, we saw that approach in Atlanta, Washington, DC. So I'd like to see something in Massachusetts, um, you know, where there's more investment in a whole family or two generation approach. Um, we we need to to understand, you know, the the family has more than just one need at a time. It, it, there are multiple, you know, interventions that that can happen at the same time. So I wanted to just make a point on that. On the tool side, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta has been phenomenal in creating a tool, and we can put some links in the chat, to help us actually look at the benefit system um, based on a particular family situation. Uh, that's called the Cliff Planner. Um, and they, and they, um, and we have coaches and Worcester Community Action is participating, uh, Springfield Partners for Community Action, Budget Buddies, uh, United Way Thrive, and we're bringing more on um, to actually use the tools and test the tools. So you can actually project um, when you're doing the budgeting and coaching, you can actually look at what will this raise do to my current benefit system, um, you know, at, at allocation, and what do I need to do to budget. Um, to Gina, uh, to I think uh, Mirka's point, um, you know, somebody said, you know, I can budget, but how do I make a dollar out of 15 cents? So, you know, um, so yes, we have tools, but we also need better systems. Um, and that's why approaches like the whole family um, 
you know, approaches can work. Uh, we invest a lot in workforce development, but we invest at the low income $18 an hour job. We need to stay with the family over a long period of time in order to make it to that living wage um, career. And employers are, thankfully, employers are making some commitments. Um, we're working with an anchor collaborative. I know there's a health anchor, uh, UMass Memorial, I believe, is a health anchor organization. So there is conscious um, um, collaboration to increase local hiring and advancement um, of women and people of color. And so I just, so I wanted to make a, a plug on that. Um, um, I think, Mary Beth, um, did you want me to address the who who is um, uh, one out of seven, I think is the most common access to benefits. Um, and that's the SNAP. I believe the state uh, says there's one out of seven receiving SNAP benefits. It's hard to know who's receiving the trio because the systems are disconnected. And so I, I don't have that information. Others might have that information. If I may, I, I did want to jump in on, on that, Mary Beth, which is an access point issue. Like mm -hmm. you said, Mirka, you have to apply that every single stop. There's a campaign going on right now. It's called the SNAP Gap. I'll also put that one there. That's trying to combine our mass health application with our SNAP application because you need similar, you meet the same information. Yeah, we're requesting that people say the same thing and provide the same thing in 10 different spaces. So what the SNAP Gap will do, it will close this. And there's a lovely map that I'll also put in the chat that you can see your district, see where it is, and then also contact your legislator and say, look, these are how many people are eligible for SNAP and we're missing out on billions of dollars coming to our Commonwealth if we just close the SNAP gap. Um, so again, combine application for SNAP and, 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 and mass health. And th so that question is really difficult to answer because we don't have a database. Massachusetts, as forward as it is, is very backwards in this technology. Every single agency works in a silo, even though they, you know, might share information uh, with Social Security, uh, with other sort of agencies. Um, each individual has to apply at a different place, even sometimes within the, the DTA system, right? Like, so that's that's a systems uh, barriers issue. But I will put that there um, because that's an action step people can take today. I want to ask, um, there's a, a couple of similar questions in the chat. Joanne Gravel uh, from Family Services asked the question of relative to minimum wage and whether the increase in minimum wage is impacting access to benefits. Um, we know that a lot of benefits are not also keeping pace in terms of eligibility with the cost of living. Um, we even see that across our program eligibility. That's something that our Head Start program um, talks a lot about in terms of <clears throat> the gaps in access because it, the eligibility isn't keeping pace there. Um, and then uh, Priscilla um, is also asking in terms of what living wage is for families and single individuals. And I think if Susan Crandall from Center for Policy at UMass were on this call, she would pinpoint $28 an hour as uh, a true living wage for individuals and families to get over the cliff effect. Um, but we know in Massachusetts, the number is more like 1771 considered a living wage. So. Um, does anyone want to uh, respond to that question rather around minimum and living wages? I can I can respond uh, to that. You know, there's actually a tool, uh, the MIT Living Wage Calculator, and the and the tool that I um, use to show my two slides um, is also when I looked at the, the you know that was the um, self-sufficiency wage, but when you want to look at a living wage, it is about $30 an hour minimum um, for the same family of three. Um, so the MIT living wage calculator is a great way to sort of look at the different levels, and I can put that link into the chat. Um, on a, for an individual, um, you know, an $18 an hour wage is a good wage. Um, the issue is the benefit system when you just move up a little bit, um, you 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 end up and you saw the 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 cliff dip, and so people you know are forced to stay in that fifteen dollar an hour, that sixteen seventeen dollar an hour um, wage uh, because they um, are are making too little 
um, to make a living wage, but um, but they can't get past the cliff. So the cliff, you have to jump from like $15 an hour to $30 an hour. And that's how you make it over the cliff. Thank you. I wanted to add something to that, if I can. Um, adding housing into the mix of the cliff effect. Um, out of the outer of reach uh, report for 2021 here in Worcester County, um, you need to have a living wage of 29 dollars an hour to be able to afford a one bedroom. Yeah. And that's an average for the whole for the whole Worcester County. So um, someone um, a, a whole family needs to work 87 hours to be able to um, afford um, in a one bedroom apartment. So it's it's just it's just not something that is it's feasible and that's why we're having this conversation so that we can come up with great solutions. That is where the intersection of all of these pieces come into play here. I want to uh, pause here briefly and introduce uh, Melissa Trinidad, who we've referenced a couple of times and who is our brand new Cliff Effect coach. So this is a, a brand new role for WCAC. Um, we have a lot of roles that work directly with clients and advocate and provide wraparound services. Um, but I want Melissa to introduce herself a little bit about your background and um, what role you're playing. She's only been on the job for a month, so <laughs> no pressure, Melissa, um, but want to make sure people know, especially in, in South County where Melissa is housed at our collab site, um, just know who Melissa is and that she's a great, will be, is and will continue to be a great resource for us. Hello, everybody. Um, so I was just hired last month um, to work as part of uh, the Resiliency Center as the Cliff Effect coach. Um, my background is I do have some experience in retail banking, um, property manager of um, a low income housing complex. Um, and then I did provide a lot of wraparound services um, versus the supports as an intensive care coordinator. Um, I am hired to work in the Southern Worcester County um, as they continue to hire. Um, as Mary Beth had mentioned, they're, they're in the process of hiring somebody in Worcester so I can be supportive to, to the Worcester County um, as well during that. Um, in my role though, I will support clients. They can come in through WCAC, um, through com community partners. Um, they can be self-referred. Um, so anyone that's experienced in that increase in income um, which could result in a decrease or a loss of benefits. Um, I know Anne had mentioned we have access to this wonderful tool. I was so excited to, to help pilot this, um, the Cliff Planner. Um, so I'll be able to um, create action plans um, and kind of, you know, the next steps for families. Um, making sure that they're utilizing all of the benefits that are available. Um, in the past month, I have found almost every, per, actually every client I have worked with, they have not been accessing their full benefits that they're entitled to. Um, that's for all the reasons that were mentioned. You know, they don't understand the eligibility. There's different criteria. Well, I didn't qualify for mass health. I didn't think I had qualified for fuel assistance. Um, so it's really making sure that they're maximizing all of their benefits um, while they're in this transition back to the workforce, um, increased hours, um, what that looks like. Um, last week, I was able to meet with a, a woman who is just graduating from college, and she should be so excited as she got her cap and gown. She just received it yesterday. Um, and she's put in this like pickle where she's questioning you know, she was accepted into a bachelor's program and she's questioning, should I move forward with school? She's a part-time PCA. She's been offered a full-time job based upon her new degree she's received, but should she take that job? Should she continue her education or she could, should she stay um, just working part-time and receiving the disability for her son. Because if she takes the new job, she has this loss in benefits. Um, so we were really able to sit and kind of look at um, where she's at and where she wants to be. And I'm excited to use that new tool um, that we have access to that Ann mentioned, because she'll really be able to visualize like what that looks like. She's not me in the self-sufficiency right now. What does that look like? as she, you know, increases, you know, different career paths, her income, the decrease, 
Um, so I'm really happy that we'll be able to very visualize and create those plans. Um, so that's kind of what I'm hoping to, to do with the clients. Um, Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, it, we're really excited to have Melissa on the team. And like I said, we're looking forward to hiring a, a second Clip Effect coach and also complement with our financial coach. So uh, I know many organizations, Nirika, you mentioned um, the financial planning work that uh, Catholic Charities does. I think this is really critical economic mobility, self-sufficiency work that's so important to what we do every single day. So uh, very excited to have Melissa in um, uh, role alike peers across other organizations uh, certainly doing this work. Um, there are, there's some questions in the chat um, that in terms of the Cliff Effect Planner, I, I think we can certainly follow up uh, with the registration list to a, a we can do a one pager, um, Ellen and I uh, putting together some of these tools and sharing it out to make sure people have access to that. And of course, um, feel free to connect with WCAC directly as well. I'm also going to ask Ann Bureau um, from Worcester Community Connections, um, who, if this goes really well, I'm giving total credit to her as the person who gave us the idea to create a, a cliff effect role as part of the Resiliency Center. And I have great confidence it will with Melissa at the helm here. And if it, uh, if it goes bad, blame Ann. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, no, Anne's been an incredible influence on our work um, through the Cliff Effect Task Force. She works closely with Charlotte Hickson, who uh, Gina also mentioned is on our team at WCAC. Um, and Anne, I just wanted to give you um, a couple of minutes just to um, kind of react to what you've heard this morning um, in the context of the Economic Mobility Task Force and the Cliff Effect work um, that you've been so critical in helping us understand and leading us to ultimately building these roles. Um, I'm just blown away. I'm just so grateful for this forum. This is so wonderful. and. Um, because this is such an area of need for so many families. It's, it's the hidden, um, it's really the hidden struggle for so many working families and so many low-income families. So I'm just so grateful to be here today. And we have to talk about helping families go back to work because it can reduce um, stress in the home when there's enough finances in the home, but there's so many barriers. So I'm, and the cliff effect is, is a huge one. So just so grateful to be here. This is, everything's phenomenal. So grateful. Thank you, WCAC, for spearheading this. Um, this is this is huge. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Ann. Um, so I there's a couple questions in the chat um, that we're um, trying to answer uh, relative to financial coaching um, and house managing household uh, credit building and, and debt building. WCAC, as I mentioned, has a financial coach, but we're certainly not the only agency that has a financial coach. Um, I know Catholic Charities, Mirka, you mentioned that. Um, there's a lot of organizations that do, so we can make sure to, in our one pager, kind of uh, create that inventory um, and access points for people. But that's certainly something that um, we're trying to build in our own work. Um, I want to ask one last question of our panelists, and you've answered this in many different forms, but um, I just want to end on the note of actionable items. Um, we have um, about over 60 or so people still on the call. Um, as people are here and listening today, uh, and I encourage Melissa and, and to you also, because you're you're in the trenches in the field doing this work too. What are one or two actionable items that people can think about doing today, um, regardless of their level of expertise and knowledge? What are some things we mentioned the legislation, um, but what are some things that people ought to be thinking about that are, are actionable items? And Gina, I'm going to start with you, um, and then move around the panel and go from there. Talk to your legislator. There's so much power in that and help your clients empower them to do so because they're a constituency in base that sometimes is overlooked. And there's quite a lot of votes in that. Um, you know, firms hire a lot of lobbyists to do this, but each vote matters and they are entitled to speak to their legislators. So I would say that in my work, I always tell them, I'm like, yep, that's terrible. You can't get more, but you know, this is what is at the federal level. You should contact them because they have the power to change that. The farm bill is coming up. So just, just think about you know, how that could be utilized and both at the local and at the state and at the federal level. And um, I'm happy to help with those advocacy workshops if people are interested. Um, the, the second piece I would say is hold um, your state agencies accountable. You know, if, if you don't see people who reflect the community, 
Um, if, if you don't necessarily see that people are being treated compassionately, call them out. They're not evil. Um, they can't fix what they don't know. Um, just let them know this is what I view. Can you please fix it? And let's make those, even our own organizations, making sure that they are welcoming environments to the people that we want to help. So I would say those two things, um, please engage in contacting your elected official and let's make sure that we as nonprofits and we as you know working with our state agencies that we're also making sure that those are all welcoming spaces. Anyone else want to add to that from the panel? Um, yes, um, I would just, um, just educating everyone, not just our clients, but our family members, our friends, um, and anyone that's to be interested in learning about the cliff effect, about everything that is going on. So not only that they know, but they can also take action with us and empowering them, like Gina was saying, to take action, to call, to be interested in knowing more and how that can change things for themselves, but also for their generations. You know, and I and I also, you know, I, I'm glad you said that because um, I was going to say education and awareness is the first step to show, you know, what systems look like and how they impact real families and real people. Um, and I think that, you know, shifting and ensuring that our legislative body, our nonprofits, our other organizations, really thinking about you know, what's the impact and how can I help the whole family? I mean, we are rich in programs in Massachusetts. We are very poor in systems. Our funding doesn't work, you know, in, in you know, to support collaborations amongst partners. And so I know in Springfield, it becomes sort of, if I win, you, you know, you lose. It's not that. It's really about you know, creating more resources and, and leveraging the resources we have so that we're not all targeting the same population for one program at a time. We need to create a collaborative approach to uh, working with families. And that's why, you know, so I would love to see more um, uh, education, awareness and funding for collaborative um, work. I, I think that Gina, Mirka, and Anne have hit wonderful um, points with the advocacy and the education and the funding. I'm going to go a little bit more person to person grassroots on this, get to know the people that this is impacting, get to know the clients, take the time to meet a family that's on food stamps, that's receiving SNAP, of, you know, talk to someone who's trying to navigate the housing, the housing programs right now. Um, the quickest way to, to, um, to forget who we're dealing with is by not having those person-to-person -person connections. Um, we talked a little bit about bringing that human component into it. Um, we got We have to lean in and get to know, get to know people who are in different situations than ourselves. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for uh, to Gina, to Anne, Mirka, Emily, and to, and to Anne Bureau and, and Melissa for adding their responses as well. Um, we WCAC can't do this work without you. Um, we're so lucky to have incredible partners uh, and colleagues like you with us. Um, so we'll look forward to this, continuing this important conversation. There's so much work to be done. Um, WCAC is committed to continue to host these community conversations. We'll probably have a 2.0 version of this very topic and conversation um, sometime in the late 2022, 2023. Ellen is maybe cringing a little bit at this point. It's a, it's a little bit of work to do these, but we think it's so important to do it. Um, and just really, really thankful for everyone for participating, for just being who you are, bringing your passion and heart to this work as number one, um, and for being great partners. So I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your Tuesday. Uh, this is recorded. We're going to be posting it on our website. We'll be um, sending out follow-up information to everyone who's registered. Uh, and please feel free to reach out to us. Our contact's on wcac.net. Um, our doors are open and we're eager to learn and do together. So thank you so much for joining us this morning. And thanks again to our panelists. Have a good rest thank of your you. week, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.